Did Gottlob Frege succeed in reducing mathematics to logic? Alas, no. When the second volume to Freya's Basic Laws of Arithmetic 1893, had been sent to the printer, he received a letter from British philosopher, historian, and mathematician Bertrand Russell, 1872-1970, in which Russell introduced his famous paradox. Is the class of all classes that are not members of itself a member of itself or not? The question is coherent but it entails a contradiction, so it has no answer. Freya had to admit that he had no foundation for his reasoning. A scientist can hardly encounter anything more undesirable than to have the foundation collapse just as the work is finished. I was put in this position by a letter from M.R. Bertrand Russell when the work was almost through the press. The great irony in this is that Russell embarked on his own project to reduce mathematics to logic and failed. Did Gottlob Frege succeed in reducing mathematics to logic? Alas, no. When the second volume to Freya's Basic Laws of Arithmetic 1893, had been sent to the printer, he received a letter from British philosopher, historian and mathematician Bertrand Russell, 1872-1970, in which Russell introduced his famous paradox. Is the class of all classes that are not members of itself a member of itself or not? The question is coherent but it entails a contradiction, so it has no answer. Freya had to admit that he had no foundation for his reasoning. A scientist can hardly encounter anything more undesirable than to have the foundation collapse just as the work is finished. I was put in this position by a letter from M.R. Bertrand Russell when the work was almost through the press. The great irony in this is that Russell embarked on his own project to reduce mathematics to logic and failed. What was Vico's cyclical idea of history? Vico believed that there are cultural patterns that dominate in different societies. Thus, law, religion, politics, art, and manners all tend to match up at any given time and place. For example, he drew connections between Athenian law and its pre-Socratic and Socratic philosophies. In his cyclical account of history, or what he called Corsi e Recorsi, societies organically develop and then age and rot. He posited a bestial condition, a time of the gods, and a time of heroes which also leads to oligarchies, or rule by the richest. This is followed by an age of men. Characterized by class conflict, until the society decays. Vico applied this theory to the history of Rome. Beginning with the mythical founders Romulus and Remus and ending with its overthrow by external barbarians.
Who was William Hamilton? William Hamilton, 1788-1856, was a professor at Scotland's University of Edinburgh. He is famous for his philosophy of the conditioned in Scottish common sense philosophy. He agreed with Immanuel Kant, 1724-1804, that we cannot know things in themselves. But also with Thomas Reed, 1710 to 1796, about naturalism. Reed's idea that we know things in the world directly and Kant's idea that we do not know things in themselves are contradictory. Hamilton believed that they could be mysteriously combined through intuition. John Stuart Mill, 1806 to 1873, in an examination of Sir William Hamilton's philosophy, 1865. Vigorously attacked Hamilton's notion that scientific principles are intuitively valid. Rather than valid on account of their ability to provide causal explanations, as Mill thought. How was Gian Battista Vico a unique philosopher of his time? Gian Battista Vico, or Giovanni Battista Vico, 1668 to 1744, was an Italian philosopher and jurist who is credited with having founded the philosophy of history as well as the modern understanding of history. He provided painstaking analyses of ideas in the past and accounts of how they developed over time. Due both to varied circumstances and events, as well as the content of the ideas themselves. In that sense, Vico invented intellectual history. Did Augusta Comte believe in altruism? Yes. In fact, Comte coined the word altruism, meaning an obligation to help and serve others. Even at cost or harm to one's own self-interests. How was Vico's thought opposed to the Enlightenment? Vico's main thesis was, the order of ideas follows the order of things. The Enlightenment thesis, by contrast, was, the order of things follows the order of ideas. That is, Vico thought that ideas are the result of physical reality. Whereas Enlightenment optimists held that reality can be directed by reason. Also, Vico believed in a cyclical progression of human events. Whereas an overarching faith of the Enlightenment was in the existence of progress, which meant real change. What was unusual about Vico's autobiography? Vico told the story of his life, Life of Giambattista Vico written by himself. 1725-1728, in the third person, and he analyzed both the effect of his 
circumstances on his temperament and how his ideas developed before he began writing. His autobiography is thus his intellectual history. Here is how it begins, Sr. Gayambadis Tavico. He was born in Naples in the year 1670 of upright parents, who left behind them a very good reputation. The father was of cheerful humor, the mother of a quite melancholy temper. And both came together in the fair disposition of this little son of theirs. As a boy he was very lively and restless, but at the age of seven he fell headfirst from high on a ladder to the floor. And remained a good five hours motionless and senseless. Fracturing the right side of the cranium without breaking the skin, hence from the fracture arose a shapeless tumor. And from the many deep lancings of it the child lost a great deal of blood. Such that the surgeon, having observed the broken cranium and considering the long state of unconsciousness, made the prediction that he would either die of it or he would survive stolid. However, neither of the two parts of this judgment, by the grace of God, came true. But as a result of this illness and recovery he grew up, from then on, with a melancholy and acrid nature which necessarily belongs to ingenious and profound men, who through ingenuity flash like lightning in acuity, through reflection take no pleasure in witticism and falsity. Who was F? H. Bradley Francis Herbert, F. H. Bradley, 1846-1924, was a main architect of 19th century British idealism. But he was also highly influential as an intuitionist. His principal work was Ethical Studies, 1876 in which he sought to explain how morality can be part of individual consciousness and social institutions. He argued that individuals believe that morality is an intrinsic value, which, depending on their social status, they self-realize in their actions. Good selves could be actualized only if bad selves were suppressed. Therefore, the good self requires the bad self and morality can never be completely actualized unless oneself dies through surrender to Christianity. What was Gottlob Frege's landmark insight about meaning? Freya's theory of language was set forth in three essays. Function and concept, on concept and object, and sense and reference. He noted that some identity statements are true and informative. For example, the sentence Venus is Venus, does not tell me anything, but the sentence. The morning star is the evening star, is informative, although it means the same as Venus is Venus. Because Venus is in fact both the morning star and the evening star. What were Augusta Cohn's sociological ideas?
Cohn believed that in all the sciences, there are three historical phases. Theological, metaphysical, and scientific or positive. The theological phase contains religious restrictions and belief in the supernatural. The metaphysical phase involves the justification of political rights above authority. In the scientific phase, solutions to social problems can be found. By combining these laws of phases, Kohn developed an encyclopedic law, according to which all of the sciences could be ordered into a hierarchy in which sociology was the greatest and included all of the others. Kohn wrote, if it is true that every theory must be based upon observed facts, it is equally true that facts cannot be observed without the guidance of some theories. He thus posited an interconnection between facts and theories, which holds to this day. What was Gottlob Frege's main innovation in the philosophy of logic? Freya treated predicates as functions and subjects as arguments. Thus Socrates is mortal becomes function mortal is applied to argument Socrates. In his conceptual notation, 1879, Freya also introduced a simple way to treat words and terms such as all and there is as logical quantifiers. Logical quantification is a notational system that connects a variable with what is being talked about. For example, in the sentence every person alive today will die someday. Person alive today is being talked about and every is the quantifier. This treatment of Freya still stands today. Did Gottlob Frege succeed in reducing mathematics to logic? Alas, no. When the second volume to Freya's Basic Laws of Arithmetic 1893 had been sent to the printer, he received a letter from British philosopher, historian and mathematician Bertrand Russell, 1872-1970, in which Russell introduced his famous paradox. Is the class of all classes that are not members of itself a member of itself or not? The question is coherent but it entails a contradiction, so it has no answer. Freya had to admit that he had no foundation for his reasoning. A scientist can hardly encounter anything more undesirable than to have the foundation collapse just as the work is finished. I was put in this position by a letter from M.R. Bertrand Russell when the work was almost through the press. The great irony in this is that Russell embarked on his own project to reduce mathematics to logic and failed. What was F. H. Bradley like as a person? Bradley was made a fellow at Merton College, Oxford. In 1870. This was a lifetime position with no teaching duties, which only marriage could terminate. Bradley never married, and he lived on campus until he died. 
a kidney inflammation in 1871 left him careful of his health. And although he participated in the governance of the college, he avoided other social occasions. For instance, he turned down an opportunity to be a founder of the British Academy. Bradley detested cats and shot them on the college grounds, during the night. R.G. Collingwood His neighbor for 16 years, later wrote. Although I lived within a few hundred yards of him, I never to my knowledge set eyes on him. What was unusual about Carl Friedrich Gauss' personality? Gauss, 1777-1855, was meticulous, conservative, and did not much enjoy teaching or other disruptions of his work. He did not collaborate or help younger mathematicians. Neither did he appreciate interruptions. It is said that he was once concentrating on a problem when told that his wife was dying. He responded, tell her to wait a moment till I'm done. How were Joseph Marie de Maester's ideas similar to Edmund Burke's? Joseph Marie de Maester, 1753-1821, was a Roman Catholic political theorist who sought to restore traditional society according to Thomism, the teachings of Thomas Aquinas C. 1225 to 1274, he viewed the French Revolution as satanic, in his 1796 considerations on France. However, de Maester went beyond Burke in his belief that the Catholic Church would triumph over Enlightenment philosophy. In his 1810 essay on the generating principle of political constitutions, he described a fundamental human and God-ordained desire for order and discipline. What was 19th century intuitionism? To some extent all philosophical systems have a place for intuition. Direct knowledge that is non-inferential or cannot be proved by prior argument and for which there is no way to resolve doubts. Mill thought that William Wools, 1794-1866, philosophy of science was intuitive. Although it was in places quite inferential. However, Wuol did have an explicitly intuitionist moral theory. Other noteworthy 19th century intuitionists were William Hamilton, F. H. Bradley, Henry Sidgwick, James Martineau, and, toward the end of the century and into the next, Henry Bergson. How did John Stuart Mill criticize William Wool's view of moral intuitionism? Mill's criticism of Wool's moral intuitionism was that it implied that morality could not progress because necessary truths are always true. Mill further claimed that Wuol's necessary moral truths would preserve the status quo. 
and he charged Wool with conservatively supporting slavery, marriage without women's consent, and cruelty to animals. What Mill missed, however, was that, as with fundamental ideas in science, Wool held that we may not know all of the relevant rules of morality. Thus, discovering these rules allowed for moral progress. Why did Vico oppose Cartesianism? Vico concluded that René Descartes, 1596 to 1650, had been too enamored of mathematics and natural philosophy. Science, to the neglect or dismissal of art, law, and history as valid fields of knowledge. Vico also did not think that Descartes was right in seeking the same kind of certain knowledge in science that mathematics yielded. In his first book, On the Ancient Italian Knowledge, 1710, Vico argued that Descartes was wrong in holding awareness of his own existence as a first philosophical principle, and in trying to prove God's existence through reason alone. Vico's own view was that the mind does not make itself end for that reason cannot know how it has knowledge of itself. Concerning mathematical and even scientific certainty Vico did not think we can arrive at it through clear and distinct ideas, as Descartes claimed. He claimed that mathematical knowledge is certainly true because the human mind has created the very standard for mathematical truth, or because we have made mathematics. However, God has made the physical universe, and only he can have certain knowledge about that. Vico did concede that when we do make things in nature, or through scientific experiment, we can gain knowledge from the confirmation of our hypotheses. What are Venn diagrams? British philosopher and logician John Venn, 1834 to 1923, invented the system of logic diagrams named after him, which consisted of the overlapping circles. They can be used to test and demonstrate the validity of inferences. Venn diagrams illustrate collections of sets and their relationships to each other, which are useful in logic theory. A Venn diagram of sets A, B, and C, where one or more sets overlap, it means that they have members in common. It can be seen by the overlapping in this diagram that some things are A, B, and C. Some things are A and B, some things are B and C, and some things are A and C. Who was Jules Henri Poincaré? Jules Henry Poincaré, 1854-1912, was a mathematician, physicist, and philosopher of science. He responded to the discovery of non-Euclidean geometry by suggesting a modification of Immanuel Kant's 1724-1804, claim that we have synthetic a priori knowledge of the world, that is, 
certainly true knowledge that applies to reality, which is not based on experience. His proposal was what became known as conventionalism, namely that physicists will retain Euclidean geometry because it has the simplest geometrical conventions and is therefore appropriate for them. This proposal was short-lived in mathematics, because Albert Einstein was to show in his general theory of relativity that the curvature of space obeyed the principles of non-Euclidean geometry. However, the broader principle of conventionalism, namely that truth in science depends on agreement about specified rules, was to be revived as an idea of scientific truth in the 20th century. What was Vico's new view of history as knowledge? Unlike the Cartesians, who dismissed history as a hodgepodge of fiction and unconnected facts, Vico thought that the historian can achieve more certainty than the scientist because he is studying the story of a world made by humans. He disagreed with Hugo Grotius, 1583-1645, Thomas Hobbes, 1588-1679, and others, who began with the idea of a state of nature or some other way of positing a static, unchanging human nature. He was wary of what we would call anachronism, or assuming that words had the same meanings in the past as they do now, or that people have always thought the same way. Vico believed that historical events change human ideas. Vico asserted that every theory must start from the point where the matter of which it treats first began to take shape. According to Vico, the way the historian can discover the minds and feelings of those in past times is to decode their language, myths, and customs. For example, he believed that what are considered metaphors, myths, and fables at one time may have been the literal truth to people in the past. How can this be? Freya's explanation was that there is a difference between sense and reference. Reference is the actual planet Venus, in this case. But sense is how the planet is referred to by the term morning star i.e., a bright object in the eastern sky before sunrise. Thus, the morning star does not stand for Venus itself, but for the sense of how Venus is presented. This is why the two sentences that appear to be equivalent really are different. It explains why it is not informative to say that Venus is Venus or that the morning star is the morning star but it is informative to say that Venus is the morning star. What was William Wool's intuitionist moral philosophy? Wool, 1794-1866, claimed that conscience enables direct perception of moral goodness and badness. However, he did not describe conscience as a separate 
moral faculty but as reason exercised on moral subjects. Moral rules are primary principles of reason, discoverable by reason itself. He took them to be self-evident necessary truths. Who was Henry Sidgwick? Henry Sidgwick, 1838-1900, was not so much an intuitionist as the first modern moral theorist who used a combination of common sense and shared intuitions to assess the competing moral theories of his day. As a professor at Cambridge University, he was active in founding Nunham, the first college for women. His wife, Eleanor Mildred Balfour, whose brother, Arthur, was later Prime Minister of England, became principal of Nunham in 1892. The Sidgwicks collaborated on many reform and intellectual projects including investigations into parapsychology. Sidgwick's principal works are The Methods of Ethics, 1874, and Outlines of the History of Ethics, 1886. What is non-Euclidean geometry? Euclidean geometry depends on a number of axioms, most important of which concerns the property of parallel lines. Non-Euclidean geometry changed Euclidean axioms. It was to have application in physics, particularly Albert Einstein's theory of relativity, when it enabled a concept of the fourth dimension. Carl Friedrich Gauss, 1777-1855, was the first to figure out the principles of non-Euclidean geometry. Although because he did not publish his ideas. The credit was given to Jano Spoliagi, 1802-1860, and Nikolai Lobachevsky, 1792-1856, who were working independently. They rejected the Euclidean assumption that could not be proved in which only one line passes through a point in a plane that is parallel to a separate coplanar line. In their new system, a line can have more than one parallel end. The sum of the angles of a triangle may be less than 180 degrees. By the middle of the 19th century, Bernhard Riemann 1826-1866 developed a geometry in which straight lines always meet, thereby having no parallels. And in addition allowing for the sum of the angles of a triangle to be greater than 180 degrees. In Euclidean geometry Parallel lines never meet and the sum of the angles of a triangle is always 180 degrees. Rayman also went on to distinguish between the unboundedness of space as part of its extent and the infinite measure over which distance could be taken that is related to the curvature of the same space. Riemann returned to Gauss now published work and explained the new ideas of Distance first introduced by Loibakevsky and Bolyai in terms of trigonometry. The bottom line was that arc length could be understood as the shortest. Distance between two points on a surface, without reference to the geometric properties. 
or applicable geometry of that in which the surface itself was embedded. In 1868, Eugenio Beltrami, 1835-1899, demonstrated a model of a Bolyai type two-dimensional space, inside a planar circle. This proved that the consistency of non-Euclidean geometry depended on the consistency of Euclidean geometry. Thus reassuring skeptics that non-Euclidean geometry was valid. What was William Hamilton's philosophy of the conditioned? Hamilton called the condition something that has been described or classified. And the unconditioned things that are without descriptions or classifications. His philosophy was an attempt to create a balance between the conditioned and the unconditioned. Hamilton wrote that all that is conceivable in thought lies between two extremes. Which, as contradictory of each other, can not both be true, but of which. As mutually contradictory, one must be true. The law of the mind. That the conceivable is in every relation bounded by the inconceivable, I call the law of the conditioned. Hamilton held the theological belief that the infinite is incognizable and inconceivable. Who was Gottlob Frege? Gottlob Freya, 1848-1925, was a professor of mathematics at the University of Jena, who thought that Immanuel Kant. 1724-1804, was mistaken in claiming that mathematical truth is synthetic that is, about reality. Kant had claimed that mathematical truths were synthetic a priori. Which is to say both true of the world and known independently of experience of the world. His task was to show how the concepts of mathematics could be defined in terms of logic alone. So that the theorems of mathematics would then appear as logical truths. If mathematics could be reduced to logic in this way, it would be shown that mathematics was merely true by definition. Meaning that it had no empirical content, so that it could not be about the world. Mathematics would thereby be a priori, but not also synthetic, as Kant had insisted. What was Scottish common sense philosophy? It was the realist view of human knowledge put forth by Thomas Reed. 1710-1796, that what we know are real objects in the world and not our ideas, as claimed by David Hume, 1711-1776. From what did Vico believe the cycles of history originated? Vico thought that God ordained the cycles of history in his divine providence. An idea that Vico held to be compatible with the fact that human beings might have other aims or goals than what actually does transpire. This idea is believed to have been influential in Friedrich Hegel's 
1770-1831, Notion of the Cunning of Reason. The general idea is that history always turns out to be something different from what people intended. How did non-Euclidean geometry affect other fields? The relationship between space and geometry changed forever in people's minds. Thanks to non-Euclidean geometry. The question arose of whether space itself was curved. This made the whole of geometry seem hypothetical and led some to question the possibility of a priori knowledge. What were Edmund Burke's political background and beliefs? Edmund Burke, 1729-1797, was a member of the British House of Commons from 1765 to 1794. In his early career, which was more literary than philosophical, he propounded a romantic view of art. As a statesman, he resisted political and social change based on ideals and abstract ideas. Although he supported political change that would re-establish proven rights or customs. For example, while he was opposed to the French Revolution for its ideals of liberty, equality, fraternity, he was in favor of the Irish movement for independence and the American Revolution. How did Gottlob Frege attempt to reduce mathematics to logic? In his Foundations of Arithmetic, 1884, Freya argued that logic, or the laws of thought, are not descriptive of how we think and that words do not have meaning in isolation but only within context. Then in his two-volume Basic Laws of Arithmetic, 1893 and 1903, Freyo began his project in earnest by showing that every predicate determines a class that can be described logically. For example, red is a predicate and red determines a class of red things. Did Vico interact with other Enlightenment thinkers over his lifetime? No. Guyambatis de Vico's circumstances did not afford him the leisure of an intellectual vocation. Outside of Italy, only the German intellectuals, such as Johann Georg Hamann and Johann Gottfried von Herder, knew of his work. Italy was not united during his lifetime. Naples endured constant upheavals as Spain, Austria, and France took it over. Additional political stress resulted from the strength of the Jesuits within the city. Vico's father was a bookseller in Naples. After fracturing his skull as a child, Vico could not attend school for three years, so he read on his own. When he did enroll in university, he proved to be an undisciplined student. He concentrated on logic and medieval scholasticism before settling on law. 
but, after assisting his own father in a lawsuit in his teens, he never practiced law again. For ten years after 1685, Vico worked as a tutor. Reading on his own in philosophy, history, ethics, jurisprudence, and poetry. He did not like mathematics, nor was he particularly interested in science. By the time Vico became professor of rhetoric at the University of Naples in 1695, it was a Cartesian center dedicated to the study of Rene Descartes' philosophy. And Vico was opposed to many aspects of Cartesianism, especially his rationalism. From 1699 to 1708, Vico delivered the beginning lecture for the university every year. Of the essays that developed from those lectures, on the study methods of our time. 1709, was well received for its advocacy of liberal education. This was quickly followed by his 1709 lecture, on the most ancient knowledge of the Italians. In 1722 his three-volume Universal Law was complete, and in 1725 both his autobiography and the new science, which was to be revised in 1730 and 1744, were released. Vico failed to be promoted to chair of civil law and had to write poems and vanity pieces for hire to make a living. He grew bitter and his lifelong melancholy worsened. His death in 1744 followed an agonizing illness. What are some key facts about Edmund Burke's life? Edmund Burke was born in Ireland in 1729. He attended Trinity College in Dublin. And then moved to London, hoping to read law, but he was never called to the bar. Instead, he wrote a vindication of natural society and philosophical inquiry into our ideas on the sublime and the beautiful. Both published in 1756 by the bookseller Robert Dodley, who also commissioned him to write an abridgment of the history of England, which he never completed. His vindication was deliberately written in the style of the Tory statesman Lord Bolingbroke, who in overblown ways praised a pure state of nature compared to civilization. Although Burke argued for the opposite. His imitation of Bolingbroke was so convincing that many readers thought Bolingbroke had written it. Burke's theory of art was opposed to the classicist value of clarity. He thought that great art is mysterious and evocative and that the sublime inspires fear. He wrote, it is our ignorance of things that causes all our admiration and chiefly excites our passions. Was F. H. Bradley also an idealist? It's not clear whether Bradley was an idealist. Though he did believe that our direct experience of particular existence is what we can call reality. In his second major work, The Principles of Logic, 1883, Bradley attempted to construct the metaphysical system that would explain his ethics. Thought is embodied in judgments, which must be true or false. 
Ideas are the contents of judgments and they represent reality. Ideas also represent kinds of things. Each member of which is a particular individual, in the sense of an object. For example, you can have the idea of your particular pet dog, Rover. And that idea represents just Rover, but you also have the idea of dogs that represents all dogs. However, all judgments are hypotheticals claiming that certain universal connections exist in reality. For example, if one makes the judgment that dogs are good companions for humans. One is claiming that dogs in a general sense that applies to all. Dogs are good companions in a general sense that applies to all human beings. But such a judgment is hypothetical because you might have a dog that is not a good companion for you. Reality is the sum total of everything that there is in the world and as such. Reality is what Bradley called a concrete whole. One encounters reality by the experiences that one has. That is, judgments are abstract, whereas reality is particular. For this reason, thought can never fully represent reality. Another way of putting this is that the real world cannot be completely described and classified by us. Finally, in his appearance and reality, 1893. Bradley further explained that reality, as experience, is all blended in harmony. Bradley thought that relations such as bigger, smaller, before, and after our appearances, not reality. Relations are abstracted by thought from direct experience of reality. This direct experience taken altogether is the absolute, and, in a surprising turn, Bradley concluded that the absolute, or the totality of our experience, is the real reality, as opposed to something that our experience could be experience of. In other words, Bradley held both that our experiences are experiences of reality and that all of our experiences added up constitute reality. Who was Pierre-Simon Laplace's most famous student? The man who would later become the most famous French dictator in history. Napoleon Bonaparte, was one of Laplace's students. Laplace's definitive analytic theory of probabilities, 1812, was, in fact, dedicated to Napoleon. What were Burke's main ideas in political theory? Edmund Burke was a Christian pessimist who believed that there was real evil in the world and that inequality was inevitable. According to Burke, the best prospect for human society was to cling to traditions and customs that had proved their stability over generations. He thought that the French Revolution showed how great harm resulted from attempts to change society. Such attempts at change, motivated by abstract ideals, led to false hopes and vain expectations in those destined to travel in the obscure walk of laborious life. 
In his 1790 Reflections on the Revolution in France, he called talk of fraternity cant and gibberish. What is German idealism? It was the philosophical perspective developed in the 19th century that reality is not physical but psychic, or mental. Its main author was George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, 1770-1831. There were also British and American versions of Hegelian thought. What is German idealism? It was the philosophical perspective developed in the 19th century that reality is not physical but psychic, or mental. Its main author was George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, 1770-1831. There were also British and American versions of Hegelian thought. How were 19th century German idealists different from Plato or George Berkeley? Before the 19th century, idealism tended to be a train of thought in individual writers who posited the existence of unseen entities and claimed greater reality for them than the things in the world that could be sensed. Except for Plot Inus, 205-270, and other Neoplatonists. Idealism before the 19th century was limited to positing entities or structures that existed in a separate realm. Independently of perceived reality, as humans perceive reality. The 19th century idealists, in contrast, posited ideal entities and structures and also described their functions in ways that directly influenced the perceived world and events within it. A medical analogy is that before the 19th century, idealists were like philosophical anatomists. Whereas in the 19th century, Idealists also worked as philosophical physiologists. This last is especially true of Friedrich Hegel, 1770-1831, although he could not have constructed his system without Immanuel Kant's 1724-1804, work before him, and the directions in which Johann Gottlieb Fichte. 1762 to 1814 and Friedrich Schelling 1775 to 1854 tried to take Kant's work How were 19th century German idealists different from Plato or George Berkeley Before the 19th century, idealism tended to be a train of thought in individual writers who posited the existence of unseen entities and claimed greater reality for them than the things in the world that could be sensed. Except for Plot Inus, 205-270, and other Neoplatonists. 
idealism before the 19th century was limited to positing entities or structures that existed in a separate realm. Independently of perceived reality, as humans perceive reality. The 19th century idealists, in contrast, posited ideal entities and structures and also described their functions in ways that directly influenced the perceived world and events within it. A medical analogy is that before the 19th century, idealists were like philosophical anatomists. Whereas in the 19th century, Idealists also worked as philosophical physiologists. This last is especially true of Friedrich Hegel, 1770-1831, although he could not have constructed his system without Immanuel Kant's. 1724-1804, work before him, and the directions in which Johann Gottlieb Fichte. 1762 to 1814 and Friedrich Schelling 1775 to 1854 tried to take Kant's work Who was Johann Gottlieb Fichte Johann Gottlieb Fichte, 1762-1814, is regarded as an intellectual bridge between Immanuel Kant, 1724-1804, and Friedrich Hegel, 1770-1831, as well as the founder of the 19th century school of German idealism. Who was Johann Gottlieb Fichte? Johann Gottlieb Fichte, 1762-1814, is regarded as an intellectual bridge between Immanuel Kant. 1724-1804, and Friedrich Hegel, 1770-1831, as well as the founder of the 19th century school of German idealism. What are some highlights of Johann Gottlieb Fichte's career? As a student at Leipzig University, Fichte studied Benedict de Spinoza's, 1632-1677, philosophy. After he discovered Immanuel Kant, 1724-1804, he wrote an attempt at a critique of all revelation. 1792, in which he tried to show that morality was the major part of religion. This was inspired by Kant's view that an understanding of morality requires an understanding of religion. What are some highlights of Johann Gottlieb Fichte's career? As a student at Leipzig University, Fichte studied Benedict de Spinoza's, 1632-1677, philosophy. After he discovered Immanuel Kant, 1724-1804, he wrote an attempt at a critique of all revelation. 1792, in which he tried to show that morality was the major part of religion. This was inspired by Kant's view that an understanding of morality requires an understanding of religion.
How did Johan Gottlieb Fichte become famous? Soon after Fichte met Immanuel Kant, 1724-1804, in Königsberg. His first book, Attempt at a Critique of All Revelation, 1792, appeared. It drew connections between religious revelation and Kant's philosophy. Fichte had not shown it to Kant before publication. And Fichte's name did not appear as the work's author, so the book was assumed to be by Kant. Kant generously cleared up this misunderstanding, giving high praise to Fichte, who immediately became famous. The accolades were hyperbolic. One reader wrote, The most shocking and astonishing news, nobody but Kant could have written this book. This amazing news of a third son, the other two being Kant and René Descartes 1596-1650. In the philosophical heavens has set me into such confusion. How did Johann Gottlieb Fichte become famous? Soon after Fichte met Immanuel Kant, 1724-1804, in Königsberg. His first book, Attempt at a Critique of All Revelation, 1792, appeared. It drew connections between religious revelation and Kant's philosophy. Fichte had not shown it to Kant before publication and Fichte's name did not appear as the work's author, so the book was assumed to be by Kant. Kant generously cleared up this misunderstanding, giving high praise to Fichte, who immediately became famous. The accolades were hyperbolic. One reader wrote, The most shocking and astonishing news, nobody but Kant could have written this book. This amazing news of a third son, the other two being Kant and René Descartes 1596-1650. In the philosophical heavens has set me into such confusion. What are some important facts about Johann Gottlieb Fichte's career? Fichte was appointed professor of philosophy at the University of Jena in 1794, where he extended his Kantian idea of duty to criticize the drunkenness, lewdness, and brawling of the students. In 1795 he became an editor of the Philosophisches Journal, and in the preface to an article he was going to publish that had been written by a friend of his, he wrote that God was the moral order of the universe. There were complaints that this was an atheistic view, and so the governments of Saxony and other German states suppressed the Philosophisches Journal and demanded that Fichte be kicked out of Jena. Fichte defended himself in writing and then threatened to resign his university position. The Jena University authorities interpreted his threat as an offer, which they immediately accepted, so he lost his position there. Much later, in 1810, he became the first professor of philosophy at the University of Berlin. Fichte's independent philosophy was first stated in Foundation of the Science of Knowledge. 
1794, and popularized in the vocation of man, 1800. In 1796 he wrote Foundations of Natural Right, which was his treatment of natural law. In 1808 he gave a series of speeches to the German nation in French-occupied Berlin. Published as Addresses to the German Nation in 1922. In those talks, Fitch supported resistance against French dictator Napoleon Bonaparte, arguing for the common good. What are some important facts about Johann Gottlieb Fichte's career? Fitcht was appointed professor of philosophy at the University of Jena in 1794, where he extended his Kantian idea of duty to criticize the drunkenness, lewdness, and brawling of the students. In 1795 he became an editor of the Philosophisches Journal, and in the preface to an article he was going to publish that had been written by a friend of his, he wrote that God was the moral order of the universe. There were complaints that this was an atheistic view, and so the governments of Saxony and other German states suppressed the Philosophisches Journal and demanded that Fichte be kicked out of Jena. Fichte defended himself in writing and then threatened to resign his university position. The Jena University authorities interpreted his threat as an offer, which they immediately accepted, so he lost his position there. Much later, in 1810, he became the first professor of philosophy at the University of Berlin. Fichte's independent philosophy was first stated in Foundation of the Science of Knowledge. 1794, and popularized in the vocation of man, 1800. In 1796 he wrote Foundations of Natural Right, which was his treatment of natural law. In 1808 he gave a series of speeches to the German nation in French-occupied Berlin. Published as Addresses to the German Nation in 1922. In those talks, Fitch supported resistance against French dictator Napoleon Bonaparte, arguing for the common good. What were the main original ideas that were important to Johann Gottlieb Fichte's philosophy? Fichte was opposed to what he called dogmatism. Or the idea that there was an external world that was independent of human beings and what they valued. He thought that atheism, materialism, and determinism were the results of such beliefs in objective reality. And this was to the detriment of morality. Even Immanuel Kant's, 1724-1804, system had a dogmatic strain in his positing of things in themselves, which could not be known. Fitch's solution to these problems of dogmatism was idealism, mind creates everything. What were the main original ideas that were important to Johann Gottlieb Fichte's philosophy? Fichte was opposed to what he called dogmatism. 
or the idea that there was an external world that was independent of human beings and what they valued. He thought that atheism, materialism, and determinism were the results of such beliefs in objective reality. And this was to the detriment of morality. Even Immanuel Kant's, 1724-1804, system had a dogmatic strain in his positing of things in themselves, which could not be known. Fitch's solution to these problems of dogmatism was idealism, mind creates everything. How was Johann Gottlieb Fichte's idealism connected to freedom? Fitch thought that our spontaneity is something we can become aware of through reflection on ourselves as active beings, who think, as well as do things in the world. This entails that the ultimate reality is a transcendental ego, a locus of pure activity. Following Kant, Fitch meant that behind the self of which a person is aware while thinking, there is an unperceived self. Fitch believed that maturity was required to realize this freedom of the self. Those who were immature would cling to dogmatism. How was Johann Gottlieb Fichte's idealism connected to freedom? Fitch thought that our spontaneity is something we can become aware of through reflection on ourselves as active beings, who think, as well as do things in the world. This entails that the ultimate reality is a transcendental ego, a locus of pure activity. Following Kant, Fitch meant that behind the self of which a person is aware while thinking, there is an unperceived self. Fitch believed that maturity was required to realize this freedom of the self. Those who were immature would cling to dogmatism. What was Johann Gottlieb Fichte's political philosophy? In his Foundations of Natural Right, 1796, he supported individualism, but his views changed over time. His Speeches to the German Nation, 1808 Advocated concern for the common good and condemned selfish acts. He argued that egoism was untenable, morally, but that the German people could rise to a higher level because of the innate excellence of their character and language. What was Johann Gottlieb Fichte's political philosophy? In his Foundations of Natural Right, 1796, he supported individualism, but his views changed over time. His Speeches to the German Nation, 1808 Advocated concern for the common good and condemned selfish acts. He argued that egoism was untenable, morally, but that the German people could rise 
to a higher level because of the innate excellence of their character and language. Who was Friedrich Schelling? The literary and artistic romantics of his era deeply influenced the philosophy of Arthur Friedrich Wilhelm Joseph Schelling, 1776-1854. He studied at Tübinger Stift, the seminary of the Protestant Church in Württemberg, and graduated from the philosophy faculty there in 1792. He then attended lectures at the University of Leipzig while working as a tutor to aristocratic youth. At the age of 23 he received an unprecedented offer to teach philosophy at the University of Jena. He subsequently held chairs at the universities at Wurtburg, Erlangen, Munich, and finally Berlin, where he was expected to oppose the Hegelians. His primary motivation in philosophy appears to have been aesthetic. And he became known for his nature philosophy, as developed in his system of transcendental idealism, 1800. Who was Friedrich Schelling? The literary and artistic romantics of his era deeply influenced the philosophy of Arthur Friedrich Wilhelm Joseph Schelling, 1776-1854. He studied at Tübinger Stift, the seminary of the Protestant Church in Württemberg, and graduated from the philosophy faculty there in 1792. He then attended lectures at the University of Leipzig while working as a tutor to aristocratic youth. At the age of 23 he received an unprecedented offer to teach philosophy at the University of Jena. He subsequently held chairs at the universities at Wurtburg, Erlangen, Munich, and finally Berlin, where he was expected to oppose the Hegelians. His primary motivation in philosophy appears to have been aesthetic. And he became known for his nature philosophy, as developed in his system of transcendental idealism, 1800. What was Friedrich Schelling's major thesis? Schelling believed that the entirety of nature, physical as well as mental, was mind on the way toward consciousness. But consciousness, or the human self, is the creator of nature. Life cannot be explained in mechanistic or inert terms. Schelling resurrected a type of alchemical thought whereby magnetism, which is the general form of particular existence. Either becomes evident in light or maleness, or else becomes evident in heavy inertia, or femaleness. In ordinary language, although there was nothing ordinary about this belief, the alchemists believed that things that exist are all made up of a magnetic something that can manifest itself in either lightweight and airy or male, beings, or else in heavy and dense, or female, beings. He believed that existent reality became separated from the absolute in a spontaneous act of freedom. 
which created time itself, along with the world as we know it. That is, there occurred in the absolute a spontaneous burst of freedom that resulted in the separation of what we perceive as reality from the absolute. Another consequence was the appearance of time. This is to say that the absolute exists outside of time. Schelling had a following among romantics in the sciences. As well as in the arts because romantics in the 19th century, as today, loved quasi-mystical explanations of the world. Lorenz Oken, 1774-1851, for example, postulated that all of life in Schelling's sense in which nature is unconscious mind, originated in primeval slime. The connection between Oken's idea and Schelling's thought is not at all clear. Except to indicate how one wild set of ideas is capable of inspiring others. What was Friedrich Schelling's major thesis? Schelling believed that the entirety of nature, physical as well as mental, was mind on the way toward consciousness. But consciousness, or the human self, is the creator of nature. Life cannot be explained in mechanistic or inert terms. Schelling resurrected a type of alchemical thought whereby magnetism, which is the general form of particular existence, either becomes evident in light or maleness, or else becomes evident in heavy inertia, or femaleness. In ordinary language, although there was nothing ordinary about this belief, the alchemists believed that things that exist are all made up of a magnetic something that can manifest itself in either lightweight and airy or male beings, or else in heavy and dense, or female beings. He believed that existent reality became separated from the absolute in a spontaneous act of freedom, which created time itself along with the world as we know it. That is, there occurred in the absolute a spontaneous burst of freedom that resulted in the separation of what we perceive as reality from the absolute. Another consequence was the appearance of time. This is to say that the absolute exists outside of time. Schelling had a following among romantics in the sciences. As well as in the arts because romantics in the 19th century, as today, loved quasi-mystical explanations of the world. Lorenz Oken, 1774-1851, for example, postulated that all of life in Schelling's sense in which nature is unconscious mind, originated in primeval slime. The connection between Oken's idea and Schelling's thought is not at all clear. Except to indicate how one wild set of ideas is capable of inspiring others.